champion between saying that there's a disease down in Lyme, Connecticut. They didn't realize until two years ago, the entire forest surrounding her property was three to four foot high barberry, which is what we're going to talk does, about. Does this flash? When it's and it just never dawned on anyone. That was probably where it came out of. So exactly. one of the things it's, it's talking about is, is getting rid of these I'm wondering if that's plants. writing it's in standby mode. One of the things we're going to talk yeah, about, one thing with antibiotic is There's going out there and getting rid of the, the uh, mm -hmm. invasive plants. But I think so. How do you keep them from coming back? So that's why we're going to talk a little bit about yeah, here. Right. Okay. And we'll talk about other problems with invasive plants because those of us here, I mean, we're certainly concerned about Lyme disease, but there's different hooks for different people. So why do you want to talk about it? And then we'll go through there and we'll wrap up, and Tom's going to focus on this part and how to control mm -hmm. invasive mm -hmm. species. Can everyone in the back of the room read that? This is one of my favorite weird cartoons. Everybody's back here. It says, welcome to previews of this is my new horror movie, Be Ready to Scream. Network Films presents a cane from Connecticut. It says the face of evil. He goes, how scary is that? He goes, I don't see anything there. He goes, that's why it's scary. It's Deer Tick, the movie. <laughs> So I think most of us have had an encounter with deer ticks. And just to know, it's not a problem limited to Connecticut. Uh, it's interesting, I went up and spoke in Vermont a few months ago, and they actually have the second highest rate of Lyme disease in the country. It's, it's a problem as we're, we're going to show here. Throughout the Northeast and actually in Wisconsin, is in the big areas. And I think rightfully we focus on Lyme disease. And Lyme disease accounts for over 75% of arthropod, which are, are insect and spiders and all those critters, uh, diseases in the United States. It's amazing. It's, it's just so prevalent and it's not always given attention to. But like I said, it's, it's not just Lyme disease. And in a way, this is kind of a scary thing when you start looking at it. We're one of the centers of anaplasmosis. I don't know if anyone here has had that. Uh, my technician was just diagnosed with anaplasmosis. We're a center for babesiosis. We're sort of on the edge of one of the centers for rickliosis. Uh, boy, Lyme disease. It's like saying, look how it's concentrated throughout the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic and out through the upper Midwest. We don't have very much Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And there used to be a lot of it back uh, 100 years when we had more sheep. Luckily, we don't have much uh, tick-borne tool area. But we do have a new one, which is Powassan virus. I don't know if you've seen that in the news. And I'll, I'll mention that again because it, it actually transmits much, much faster after a tick bite uh, in those Lyme disease. What's the name again? Blossom virus. Uh, just look up P-O-W virus. Pow. That's, how it, that's the easiest way to find it. And these numbers are... You know, these are reported cases, but the actual number, I think we can all agree here, people who actually have Lyme disease throughout the country is much, much higher than the 25 to 30,000 reported cases. I know my physician, when I go in, I've got a tick bite and I'm starting to get some symptoms. He goes, boom, Jeff, uh, we're not even going to bother testing because we're out there. Tom, probably the same thing. We both work in the woods. And in fact, because we work where there's invasive plants, as we'll talk about later, they're just crawling with ticks. Uh, we are constantly challenged with ticks. And, you know, some of my crew actually goes out there and collects ticks so they can't even spray their clothes because they don't want to kill the ticks because they have to get live ticks. So. Come to my yard. <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks. I think I'm there. And just a, a quick review of, of the tick and the, the Lyme disease and the tick life cycle and how it relates to. Uh, is the eggs will hatch in the spring, and the first thing that will come out are the larvae. And the larvae luckily do not carry any of the uh, tick-borne diseases. Where the larvae will get the uh, disease is they will feed during the summer on small rodents and on some birds, and if those animals, what they're feeding on, are infected, they will pick up, we'll, we'll just focus on Lyme disease, They'll pick up the spirochete. Okay. And then those ticks then can vector that. They can transmit the disease to us. So they feed in the summer, and then they just basically hang around until right around June of next year. We'll show that in a second. And that's actually when most people get Lyme disease. It's actually from the nymph. 
because they're so small. I know that's how the one time I had the ring in my back, uh, it was a nymph, and they're almost impossible to spot, even if you do a full body check every night. You know, the adults, which uh, come around later in the fall, they're usually big enough you can spot them and pull them off, you know, long before they bite, I mean, long before they transmit disease. Oops, I should just stay up here and use the remote. I said, most people actually get infected in June and July when they're bitten by a nymph. Because they're so small, we don't really see them until after they start feeding the blood meal 24 to 48 hours after they attach. That's when most of us actually get infected. And the reason why we get infected, you know, it's, uh, nymphs are a little bit bigger, but boy, they're pretty small. And I know about every dimple in my body, but you know you can't check every square inch of your body every night. And if you want to be outdoors, uh, if you want to work in your garden, or in our case, work in the woods, uh, you're going to end up picking up some of them. They are just really small. The, the good news with, uh, with Lyme disease is here's the transmission rates after they attach. At 48 hours, there's only about 12% of the time they're actually transmitting the spirochete. By 72 hours, basically, they're all transmitting. So you actually have the least a day with Lyme disease before they're transmitting the spirochete. What's kind of scary about Powassan virus, and luckily it's not <coughs> real common, even though it's, well, it's reported uh, in the newspapers as in three sites, we actually now know it's in five sites in Connecticut, is this transmitted within an hour or two. <coughs> and if you, most people do not come down with the disease, but if you do come down with the disease, it's 10% fatal. So, <laughs> My crew's not real happy about that. <coughs> Does the Powassan virus also come from rodents and birds? Uh, you know what? I don't know what the, the I don't know what the <coughs> reservoir is. The reservoir for Lyme disease are primarily primarily <coughs> mice, yeah. and to a lesser extent birds. I don't know. Can you say that again? I'm sorry. I missed that. The yeah. reservoir of of Lyme disease are primarily small rodents, primarily white-footed mice here in Connecticut, to a lesser extent, you know, chipmunks and other small animals, uh, and some birds. That's probably how Lyme disease has been spreading across the landscape. You know, I came here in 87, there was a small, you know, just a little bit around Lyme. Rest day, we really didn't even have, you know, black deer ticks. They call them black-legged ticks, but whatever you want to call them. They really weren't that widespread, and now I get up in the Litchfield County, even up in oh, yeah. Vermont. They were unknown there 20 years ago. Well, farming practices, I know, because I've been around for a while, they used to burn off fields. And I'm wondering, because I live near the Connecticut yeah. River, and when they stopped doing that, I remember many, many years ago picking a line, well, it was a tick off yeah. of me. I didn't know what it was. But with burning, and you know, of course you couldn't do that now, would that explain why there is an abundance now? I mean, you're getting into the story of how widespread it is since you came here. I mean, is but, it... But the burnings, you know, I think it probably would... And I'm just speculating here, and Tom certainly jumped in. But 150 years ago, Connecticut was mostly fields, and the woods were burned on average once every seven years. That really dropped the numbers. Plus, we basically lost the deer. Now, the deer don't serve as a reservoir for Lyme disease. But where deer and large animals are very important for us, for the adults to feed on to lay eggs. We were down, 1900 down to maybe 12 deer in Connecticut. You know, we didn't have raccoons and possums back then. They actually moved uh, from uh, Virginia and New Jersey up into here. So we didn't have the large uh, mammals for the black-legged ticks to sustain a population. So it looks like they ended up in a small refugia, a small cluster down near the coast, for whatever reason, maybe on parts of Long Island. And then once they started reestablishing, like a, a lot of diseases, you know, the epidemic sort of goes hidden, and you have cases, and all of a sudden it explodes. That's probably what's happened with a deer tick. But that's speculation. I'm not an epidemiologist. I'm a, you know, I'm a forest ecologist, and Tom's a forester, so. The, uh, yeah. The point you make is 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 well taken, and uh, I believe that land management practices in general, the way they've changed in the last hundred years, are certainly a factor. 
you know, we don't have the grazing, and we don't have the the burning, and we there's a number of things that we you know we don't have the working lands uh, ethic that we had a hundred years ago here, um, and uh, all those things are, are contributory to the the change in in um, uh, population dynamics, of not only of insects but of certain birds, of certain animals, and certain plant communities. The one thing that uh, might have helped control them uh, through the 60s, before 64 and Silent Spring came out. You know, they used to spray entire towns here with insecticide to control gypsy moth. Some of you might remember, it's long before my time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I remember the spraying for mosquitoes yeah. in my yeah. childhood. Yeah. But they would end up incidentally killing ticks at the same time. And, and frankly, I don't want to see them spraying the entire town again. No. So just to let you know, some of you are probably aware of this. Uh, there is, uh, the experiment station has a, a tick management handbook you can get online. We do have some hard copies left. And uh, the CDC has put out a great book on tick-borne diseases in the United States. If you haven't seen it, that's a, a great book. They're, they're both in common English. So let's talk a, a little bit about deer because that's going to set the stage for what happens out there. And they have a, a threefold impact on our systems. One, they they really eat all the native plants that are out there. Uh, and this makes it so there's a place for, for new plants to come in. And this is a, a, a side thing, just because I think it's kind of interesting. They can disperse alien species or invasive species. So to go back to what I said before, and this probably ties in a little bit with your question on agricultural practice, but also deer. Back in 1900, there were maybe 12 deer in the state. Even through the 1960s, there were basically very, very few deer in the state. Since the 1960s, the deer population exploded. It looks like it's stabilized in the last five, 10 years, but it's much, much higher than the 80,000 uh, that DEP was getting in aerial surveys. Because we know that hunters harvest 13,000 deer a year. There's at least 13 to 15,000 deer a year that are killed by vehicles. So that's 28,000 deer a year are killed that we know of just by, by people one way or the other. So the deer herd still has more deer each year. It, I think it depends. The northern part of the state is really stabilized. Down the south, I think it tends to fluctuate. <coughs> Although in my neighborhood, they've definitely gone up. And, and here's what happens when you start mm -hmm. having, like I said, you get a lot of deer in there. A normal forest should not look like that. That's kind of sad. You know, there's no wildflowers, no shrubberies. The only thing growing out there, and this will be the scary part as we talk along, is there's Japanese barberry. This is one of the first sites that Tom and I worked together on back, what's that, eight years ago now? Something like that, yeah. Yeah, it's a long time ago. And you have other sites too where there's just nothing but ferns. So I said, I, I want to talk about this just to bring in when you're talking with people that maybe their concern isn't Lyme disease, but for a lot of people, their concern with, with deer is the impact it has on wildflowers. And these are all some are beautiful wildflowers which are lost in areas of, of large deer herds. And it's also important for another thing which is really in the news nowadays, which are pollinators. We've all heard about you know colony collapse, honeybee. Mm -hmm. What isn't noticed by as many people is that a lot of our native bumblebees and bees are also disappearing. So we lose the deer, eat all the native plants in which a lot of the invasives come in, but they, just, they get rid of the, uh, the things for pollinators. So just a real quick thing, uh, eh, what the heck, I'll go through it. Uh, we actually collected a whole bunch of deer pellet groups because we were curious to see if deer could move plants across the landscape, invasive sure. plants. So we put them in the fridge for a couple months and then grew them out. And we found things, we, we found plants germinating out of them. And here's the scary thing, uh, we found 11,000 uh, individual germinants that we identified. Wow. 86 different species of deer moving across the landscape. Oh, and most of the time, deer are moving alien species, invasive species. <laughs> oh, gosh. And here's just another shot of just how devastating. We found they can move things like Japanese stiltgrass. Not really important for Lyme disease, but one of the other things that can uh, help moss populations are autumn, autumn olive with the fruits, which are edible for people and certainly help uh, promote rodent populations. Multiflora rows. We found just as many ticks in multiflora rows when we walk into it as anywhere else. Mm -hmm. uh, things like uh, wine raspberries, a non-native species, but again, a lot of fruit. It helps promote rodent populations. 
and honeysuckles, which again have an edible fruit. So why, why should you care when we're, we're talking about this? And this is pretty nasty. You can sort of see my wife is hidden there. That's all invasive Japanese barbary, mixed in with rose. Like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll hit the Lyme disease here in a second, but they also have a lot more earthworms in those areas. And one of the problems you have with too many earthworms is they eat all of the leaf litter. And you get nothing but castings, and that leads to erosion, and that leads to gully formation. And why we, why we worry about that from a human health standpoint is suddenly we have, when we have all that erosion, we have all those nitrates and phosphorus getting into all of our rivers. That affects water quality, and because most of us, maybe not in this room, but most of us in Connecticut drink from public reservoirs, having all that phosphorus and nitrogen get into the drinking water has a real impact, because we get it from reservoirs. Most people scratch their heads and say, we, we thought earthworms were good. You know, we're, we're cultivating earthworms in our compost and so forth, that, because they're good for our gardens, and, and that may very well be be the case, but the escaped earthworms in the natural environment, in the forest setting, yeah, as you were, uh, are, are what the problem is. Is the earthworm native? I told you no. Was not. No. no. That's what I they, they are native anywhere where there's glaciers. You know, sort of like that tending the garden theme earlier. You know, if you've got a few earthworms in your garden, they're great. A lot of earthworms in the forest are horrible. Hmm. Yeah. So let's get on to the part that you guys are probably really interested in. Is this link between invasive species or alien species? I just use alien because it's kind of cute. <laughs> An increased risk of, of Lyme disease. And, and just to tell the story behind all this, we were actually just studying invasive species. And I said, I'm a forest ecologist slash forester. And we were just looking at controlling it because we weren't getting new trees coming in. We were losing the wildflowers. And at that point, I've been working in the forest here in Connecticut for over 20 years. and you know, you get a couple ticks on you every day, it's no big deal. That's just, a little, well, it's just part of where we work. And by 10 o'clock one morning, we were working in the Barberry, I had a dozen, two dozen ticks on me. But I go, something here is really weird. <clears throat> so I talked to a guy with the nature concerns. He said, oh yeah, they found this study up in Maine, which I'll mention in a second. He said, there's a big link between invasive species and the ticks that are carrying Lyme disease. There's Elias et al, the group up there, I'll, I'll show them in a second. So we, we put together a little map, and we look at the states where, just this is just for Barbary, where Barbary is listed as invasive and where Lyme disease is. But it's not an exact match, but boy, it's pretty darn close, isn't it? It's kind of scary. And this could be one of the other changes in the landscape, is in the last uh, 20, 30 years, these invasive species, which we're going to show really foster uh, a lot of the ticks, have really exploded across the landscape. We haven't really. Um we haven't really documented this, but it's my personal opinion that uh, the first naturalized population of Japanese barberry in our state was in the Lyme area. That's you yeah. know though, that's that area is one of the first places where where barberry became established and it spread and it's really uh, grown from there. And one of the interesting things in Charlotte, it's a lot with invasives, but when we first started. Well, Tom probably started here back in the late 70s. I started here in the late 80s. Um, and Charlotte's been here since the early 90s. Yeah, you know, invasives were just sort of like, oh, well, that's something we're kind of curious about before it became a big issue that it is nowadays. And not just uh, here in southern New England, but all of New England, the mid-Atlantic, now throughout the country. So like I said, we're, we're going to talk about, you know, our work here, but it's not just our work. You know, the, the study that got us going, uh, it was actually an early paper of this, was one up in Maine where they found exotic invasives, by that they mean, you know, not native plants, increased risk of Lyme disease because of the plague ticks. And out in Missouri, they found out that uh, honeysuckle, that's a non native invasive honeysuckle, increases the risk of auriculosis spread by lone star ticks. And there's been other studies now showing that in areas where there's a lot of invasive plants, you get a lot of these arthropods, which increase the risk of tick-borne diseases. <coughs> here's, here's always one of my favorite slides. So if you go into a typical Connecticut forest, what are your chances of running into a tick 
that is carrying Lyme disease. It's carrying this pyrotechnic called Asian Lyme disease. Well, typical Connecticut forest, and it really cycles year by year, so we're looking at an average year, has about 10 ticks per acre that are carrying Lyme disease. 10? Yeah. So it's a 10% chance? Well, it it, it, so there's 10 per acre, or so we'll just look at that. So every dancing tick you see here represents 10 ticks per acre. So if we go into an area of Japanese barberry, there's not one tick per acre. Uh, oh, there's not 50. Oh, there's oh, not 100. Oh, oh my God. That's there's awesome. about 126 ticks per acre. Oh. Which have the spirochetes calls the Asian Lyme disease. So we're not 10. Now we're talking 126. So let me let me clarify that for you and emphasize that. Jeff Jeff just said that 126 ticks per acre that have the Lyme disease spirochete. There's lots more ticks than that in these areas. Lots more. Oh yeah. So roughly uh, there's about 250 to 300 ticks per acre out there. So in areas with with barberry. There's uh, about half of them are carrying uh, Lyme disease. Yep. In areas without barbary and the invasives, I think it's roughly 10, 15% of the ticks are carrying. Uh -huh. There's actually fewer ticks and a fewer percentage Lower of them percentage, yeah. are carrying them. We don't know the reason why it's a higher percentage. Mm -hmm. So Now, you're talking about an area that has a dense, Road. We're talking an area that's at least the size of this room. But how many barberry plants are within that area? Is it strewn with barberry? I have two barberry plants. Which well, I well, that's a great question. And it's a question we commonly get. I, and I have a couple of barberry plants in my house. Do you worry about an individual barberry bush? No. What, what happens is, and I'll, uh, well, I can jump ahead here a little bit, is barberry create a microhabitat? which is very a high humidity micro habitat, which is very conducive to ticks. It helps uh, enhance tick survivorship. So I'll get it, that's a great question. If you've got one or two plants or you've got a, a barberry hedge that you keep trimmed in front of your house, don't worry about it. That's not a problem. We're talking areas the size of this room, an area that uh, both of us have been at in a line, 120 acres of almost solid barberry, the last one with rows. And if you get out in the woods, you'll start seeing these large patches. Uh, they're taking you, care of something. Go ahead. You look in the you look in in the springtime in March. Not this past year. There was still snow on the ground. But um, but uh, you begin to see this green up at the ground level. That's your barberry. That's and and you and, and as soon as you realize that barberry is the first thing that greens up in the springtime, you'll become aware of just how just how extensive it is uh, through through the forest. Say not to worry about the barberry, individual plants and barberry hedges, but they provide seeds for birds to scatter into the, into the forest, don't they? So well, I think you should worry about it. Well, I'm just saying, uh, don't worry about the risk of Lyme disease from the ones in your property. I personally have gotten rid of all but one of my barberries, and I just keep it there to show my family over what to, to talk about. Um, <laughs> Boring at your house. Do you give this talk to them while they're you know, visiting? <laughs> you know what? If you have a scientist in the family, you got to have <laughs> at least I don't do nuclear physics, right? Yeah. <laughs> so um, you're absolutely right, and I would encourage planting native species uh, on, on that part. Um, there are some new varieties of barberry which produce very, very few seeds. And I know Yukon is in the final stages of developing a barberry, which is completely sterile. So you can plant and not have seeds. I know they've, they've developed a, a burning bush, a wing euonymus, that doesn't produce seeds. And I know they're right on the cusp of having a barberry. So. Do you have a picture of just what barberry looks like? Uh, the very first slide I have. Or if you email it to me. Um, oh, that's exactly what I'm Yeah, yeah. It's, well, I tell you, if you walk up and you see something that's got spines on it, and they aren't rows with the big spines or small spines, chances are pretty good as part of it, if it's a bush. So you can go out there and treat it. And we find out that within two years, you can reduce it from 120 down to 40. Now, it takes out a two-year life cycle. It's going to take a while to drop it. Yeah? And you said something about you want this. Is that related to barber? No, no. It's just another invasive species, oh, okay. just in general. And it grows so tall that we, I don't think there's any increased risk of Lyme disease in burning bush. It's just another one. 
That is for people who like to see graphics. Yeah. So this is going to, what we're going to look at now is, is you, you had that great question about why. Which is absolutely, and that's what we wondered. It's like, why the devil? And at first we thought was, you think about, you got this, this barberry, it's this spiny bush, it's incredibly dense. Well, we're working out there, we're wearing what, double front car hearts? Yeah. Leather gloves, leather boots, thick jackets, just so we don't get ripped to shreds. We thought, boy, if you're a mouse, this has got to be the perfect habitat because you can scamper through that pretty fast and a coyote can't come in and eat you. And, you know, raptor's going to have a hard time coming down on you. So we actually um, trapped uh, mice. And I think just because our, our areas were so small, we didn't find the big difference in mouse populations. So we can't necessarily blame the mice on a smaller scale. Okay. But uh, what we did then is we set up, um, we looked at temperature and humidity in areas with barberry and areas where we actually used uh, propane torches to kill the barberry. So we still had the physical structure. So it wasn't that we mowed everything <laughs> down, we just... And we found out it really is the heat and humidity. Those areas where we just killed the barberry are much drier and much hotter. Uh, not only compared to areas where uh, there's native vegetation, where there's barberry, but also native vegetation. And this is where it's kind of cool. They've done studies and ticks, if they're in a couple of hours of humidity below 80%, which is pretty high humidity, they desiccate and die. So barberry bushes actually produce like this vapor cloud around from transpiration that keeps the humidity high. And what will happen is once it starts drying out, the ticks will drop down into the leaf litter where it's, it's moist and humid. And then they'll sit down there and they're really not questing for a blood meal. And when humidity comes back up again, they climb back up again. So they're really open to predation. When, this is just my guess. When they're climbing back up and down and they have a, a harder time you know, finding a blood meal because they aren't sitting out there. Quick question. Yeah. We think, I mean, we all know that when it's dry, they die. Yeah. I mean, that's the one thing you take, can't handle. But barberry is so dense and so nasty. How do they pick up the next host? Well, there's a lot of mice climb up. Uh, two ways. One, there's a lot of mice out there. But yeah. I thought you said when you studied, there weren't too many in the. Well, there's, there's, still, there's still plenty of mice out there. There's, and I yes. think one of the problems with our study, and we've actually expanded out, we haven't seen the results yet, is going, we were cutting areas as big as this room. Not as big as this room. Yeah. Right? yeah. And the thing is, we think mice are going back and forth from the barberry into the areas where we cut and killed it. So what we did a couple of years ago, we're still looking at the results, is we cut some 20-acre patches. And of 20-acre intact patches. So we're going to find. Um, but the other thing is, that, believe it or not, deer walk right through that barberry. That's, I don't know about you, but that's how I try to get into it, yeah. is there's deer trails going through there. So that's and the those, for that. Yeah. And those plants are perfectly shaped for a tick to get out there and quest at the tips of the branches or along the branches, as the case may be. The, the one other thing, and I'll take your question, is remember that the ticks don't only feel on small rodents, they feel, feed on birds. And, you know, you've got all that barberry fruit out there. Birds come in and eat it, and the ticks can latch on the birds. Yeah. Actually, I was going to ask, when you did that, I did have a question about when you pick up the ticks. I do a lot of hiking, and some people say, no, it comes from the bottom. Some people say from the top. I'm assuming altitude is where you're most likely to pick up ticks. Well, they they quest at the out on on vegetation. They do. You know, they hang out there when the conditions are right and wait for something warm-blooded to walk by or land nearby, as the case so may be. So being covered upper is probably a little more important than... Well, it depends on the nature of the vegetation and the trails where you're walking, you know. Uh, but I would say, yeah, you need to cover all over. Yeah. Um, <coughs> we're from uh, New York State, and we hear anecdotal stories from friends of ours in different areas of the states, higher elevations where they're seeing, uh, having more cases of Lyme disease, uh, seeing more deer ticks where they hadn't been seeing them in their yards and, and, and forests around them. Also, central New York, which had uh, comparatively towards the Hudson Valley, had a low rate of Lyme disease. We're seeing more and more, more and more cases of Lyme disease. In what way do you think uh, that both invasive species and uh, 
and that climate change have perhaps contributed to uh, the spread? I, I don't think it's climate change so much as that the, the ticks are spreading out at the same time we're seeing this explosion of invasives across the landscape. And what's interesting, if you start getting into, uh, like into Vermont, or if you start getting into, uh, you know, the higher elevations during the growing season, they tend to be more human. So once the ticks get there, so long as there's, uh, you know, something for them to feed on the first couple of stages of the life cycle, so long as there's mice and, you know, rook and birds, you know, they can have their population grow. And like I said, the, the deer population, you know, throughout the region is certainly hit a historically high plateau. It's probably higher now than when Native Americans were here. Oh, you just pulled out a barbara Charlotte? You found uh -huh. one right out here? <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to do a field session and go outside and do the kind of control Jeff did. But I just got to the uh, library. So I would say at the break, go back and take a look. Look, but don't touch unless you want. They call it barberry because the spines have barbs like fish hooks. Once they're in you, uh, you either let them fester out or you get a razor blade and cut them out. Oh, yeah. if, if I can add something to that response, um, like like the other garden we discussed, it it's uh, it's complex and there's lots and lots of factors that it's hard to uh, to know about them all and it's hard to control for them and. Um, uh, so much of uh, the health of the environment depends on the diversity of things that are out there. And so it's, it's difficult to put a, point a finger at any sort of one thing like climate change or just the deer or you know, just the spread of invasive. All of these things contribute to each other and, um, and uh, you know, the relationships are, are quite complex. And, and Tom, actually you brought up something which I'd never thought of, and actually because of your garden analogy, it might be something we could take a look at. The reason why barberry and some of the other invasives do so well, the reason why people like planting them in the garden, they don't have any insects that eat them. Yeah. Which actually makes some biological desert for songbirds because they need those insects for their right. young. Even frugivores, those that feed on fruit, need insects for that first couple of years of their young's life, life for the protein. Right. So if, the, if you got a lot of barberry out there and you don't have any insects on them, you aren't gonna have any, any insect predators out there which could incidentally feed on the ticks. That might be that would actually be something interesting to look at. So, yeah, yeah. so like I said, there's it's an interesting uh, little triangle there between you know deer fostering this environment, like I said before, which allows for a lot of alien invasive species, uh, which then can foster uh, uh, ticks and eventually Lyme disease. But the deer really move the ticks across the landscape. So just go through this real quick, is this actually from, uh, from Kirby Stafford, who's our, our tick and Lyme disease expert. He talks about uh, host targeted uh, tick control, what you can do around your house. Well, one thing is exclusion. They found out if you put a fence that's at least 50 feet from where you walk and play to keep the deer out, it really drops down uh, the number of ticks. Uh, well, it actually, it says 70 meters. Shoot, I thought it was 100 feet. 70 meters is up 200 feet. Actually, it's 220 feet, something like that. Uh, so you're talking a pretty good distance to drop them down. They also found that when they went out and did a couple studies where they uh, actually really reduced deer densities. So the deer densities are, if I remember right, are the dash line. So when they drop deer densities way down, uh, they found out that the uh, number of uh, cases of uh, Lyme disease really dropped down in the area because they dropped ticks. They did another study off Maine where they dropped the deer from 100 deer per square mile. So 100 deer per square mile is equivalent to one deer every six acres. Wow, that's not very good. So I'm thinking, you know, I live in a neighborhood where we have one acre houses, uh, house lots. So I mean, me and my six neighbors, you know, the folks we get together for a cookout, we share one deer. <laughs> that's that's pretty high deer density. Huh? Yeah, well, there's actually places where it's higher than that. Uh, and they uh, they reduced the deer density uh, way down, and they found out, you know, it was effective at reducing Lyme disease. This. Um, so, you know, using Lyme disease is deer management. I think it's just one of the arguments for reducing uh, deer damage or reducing deer density. 
but you know, reducing deer density means hunting, and that becomes a very political issue. Uh, so as a society, I'm a scientist, I don't make policy decisions. It's just one of the things uh, everyone has to think about. Can I ask a question? Sure. Can you talk about your knowledge about the, um, the feeding programs that hunters do, and also the domestic Actually, in programs? Connecticut, it's illegal to bait deer. It's illegal to feed them. Okay. If someone's doing that, uh, you could report well, them. Can I interrupt for a second? Yeah. Because I'm a hunter. Uh, you can't shoot over bait, but you can plant a crop that yeah, they well, come in and eat. And people, so yeah. in fact, they are baiting them. You know. But how often, I was going to say, I don't know anyone who really, I've actually come across feeding piles where it was pretty obvious someone was baiting it. I've never, and you might know some. Like I said, I just don't know anybody who actually, you know, plants a crop to have a field to shoot deer. I know a few people who. Anyone who has a garden is That's a good point. Yep. <laughs> yeah. I've just um, there are some concerned farmers who have been um, who I've been talking to who um, have talked about the feeding programs that some people are doing and it congests the herds. Which oh, also, you're talking about people who don't want to hunt who just I'm pretty sure and that they're, and they're purchasing like corn that's um, the cheapest ethanol corn, which also like reduces the you know the the immune system of the deer. Um, and affects well, their ability to well, fight the... Well, you can also have problems they've had on the, in the Midwest where they were doing some of this with chronic wasting disease coming in. On those now, Cameron, you, right. you might know this better. I thought it was illegal to feed deer in your backyard with large feeding stations. Okay. Yeah. As far as I know, it's only illegal to shoot them next to the feeding stations when you bring them in. But people, I mean... I know so many people who feed them for the entertainment of watching yeah, them yeah, in the yard. And they sell deer feed right at the store. And it, too. it's sold everywhere, the corn, as you said. Uh, and I think that's perfectly legitimate. It's the shooting part that is. Okay, well, like I say, I, because I don't hunt. Uh, I, think, I think so. Anyway. I said, I'm more of a plant guy. Tom, you? I'm not a hunter either. So. Yeah, so I, I eat meat, but I just don't shoot it. The, the amount of things. <laughs> The amount of ticks on the deer I've shot over the years, it's, it's stunning. Oh, and yeah. uh, my friend Dave here thinks I'm crazy to do it. He has chronic Lyme, and uh, <laughs> every time I, I, I hunt and bring a deer back, I mean, mm -hmm. the amount of ticks on the fur, it's just incredible. And of course, as the carcass cools down, they're dropping off. So I've been trying to deal with that as best I can. Wow. But, I also heard that they're that deer aren't they typically don't herd up they they live more more ice in isolated depends on time of year and so like if they're at feeding stations yeah. herding then they're sharing ticks. Uh, I'll tell you Jasmine's giving Jasmine's yeah. giving you the ten minute <laughs> side so let's let's hold it off yeah. for a little bit so let me look through this so just if you're in plant so I want to say deer are cute and cuddly oh uh, uh, that's a real shot it's not Photoshop. <laughs> uh, and deer can be part of the problem. My, my crew last week is actually feeding some deer down in Greenwich and Apple, but that's a tame deer. They get so we, drunk we, on apples. Huh? They get drunk on apples. Yeah, this is a green sort of green apple. So just really quick, because we're limited on time here. So we actually uh, put up a fence, invited the deer to stay out, maintained it. And this is just one year after putting up uh, a deer fence. You can see inside and outside the vegetation differences. The other thing coming outside. So we found out that both deer and alien species impact native regeneration. The native stuff doesn't have that high humidity levels that foster ticks. So the question is, what can we do? Uh, this actually was an island that had 750 deer per square mile, Charles Island. That's one deer per acre. They've harvested, I think, 18 deer. It's actually it's, it's a very important rookery, so they harvested 18 deer on a 16-acre island. So. They're too cute to kill. You know, like I said, it's very political. So I wanted to get through this quick so Tom can have a chance to go through the control part. Well, um, following the experiences that uh, Jeff and his crew had, and I had uh, an opportunity to share uh, with the, uh, the abundance of ticks we were finding in places where we were working to control invasive species, we uh, um, set about getting some support to 
look at methods to uh, work on controlling specifically the Japanese barberry and what, what works best uh, to, uh, um, to do some control and what's practical and what's not. There were a number of folks who uh, participated with us um, in various stages of the, um, of the process and, and the research involved and uh, uh, we had a number of sites that were um, located all over the state and in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. Uh, we worked on uh, uh, the timing of control. We looked at uh, alternatives. We looked at uh, uh, flame treating with propane torches. We looked at herbicide treatments and uh, did some comparison. And uh, as Jeff just mentioned, they are working now with some large areas uh, of, of barbary control. Um, in total, there were a, 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 a large number of uh, treatment combinations that were test, tested uh, for the timing of treatment. And um, um, and uh, testing some, some mist blowing with herbicide in these large infestation areas. And eventually we, uh, we, we, we set on a kind of a two-step process. And, and we actually came out with a little guidebook on this that so you can find online uh, at either, either of our websites. But uh, um, beginning with this barbary plant that has an initial sort of healthy appearance to it, if the first step is a mechanical treatment, meaning you cut it, you cut it right off at ground level, kill the above ground tissues, either with by cutting or with a flame, um, what's going to happen next? It's going to re-sprout, right? And if you time your if you time your second treatment uh, uh, at about the time that the the new sprouts come up, um, you can you can begin to have some positive control. Um, and, and the reason is that because here's this plant. It's come out in the springtime. And it's drawn on reserves from its root system in order to send out new shoots to break bud, to you know, do all of those things that it needs to do before the leaves begin photosynthesizing. I don't know if we can kill it at that point. It's going to need to draw our reserves again in order to send up a new shoot. So we won't get caught as many when it sends up the new shoot. It's drawing on reserves in the root. And if we can kill that second growth in the same growing season, we have a pretty good chance of exhausting that plant. Now we experimented with herbicides. We experimented with um, uh, different uh, repeated mechanical treatments, depending on the robustness of the plant and the site conditions and so forth and so on. Um, you know, you might be able to get some control with uh, with a two or three just cutting treatments. But you'll eventually exhaust the plant. Most of the time, though, you need to have something that's a little bit more positive. And the idea of doing um, the uh, the idea of using a propane torch to uh, do some of this treatment was to um, was to see if we could provide folks with a, a non-chemical, we don't call it organic because we're still using propane, but a non-chemical method for treatment. Um, we had this discussion a little while ago about fire in the environment, which used to be a fairly common thing. And the idea was, well, we, you know, it's hard to do a controlled burn, but can we Bring the mountain to Mohammed in some way, you know, and uh, can we bring flame to the and direct it at the uh, at the plants that we want to uh, uh, that we want to actually control? And um, we uh, we used a couple of different uh, um, a couple of different torch combinations: uh, 100,000 BTU torch and a 400,000 BTU torch. Um, you know, I'll tell you that the 400,000 BTU torch is four times more fun than the 100,000. <laughs> <laughs> But it's it is tiring. It's it is loud, and it's noisy. Okay. You notice our, our our gentleman here has um, has uh, ear protection on. Um, uh, you're playing with fire, so you want to make sure you're not using any uh, um, uh, artificial fabrics, you know, nylon or dacron or anything like that, because uh, if you should uh, you know burn it, it will melt and, and uh, uh, or or flash burn uh, against your skin. You wear natural fabrics, leather boots, gloves. 
you know, that sort of thing. So it's not the kind of thing you do on a 90 degree day. It's not the kind of thing you do during high fire season in the springtime. Uh, but a damp morning, high humidity, uh, following a rain or something like that, you can use a, a torch and uh, go around and, and kill plants uh, with it. And it, uh, and, it, and, it's, and it has good effectiveness. And um, uh, the reason because the high heat will, um, in addition to killing the above ground portion of the plant, will kill the, the basal buds that uh, those new shoots come from. And this is why we also recommend it as the second step of the treatment, because if the above ground part of the plant is gone, and all you have are those new little shoots, it's much easier to target the flame. It takes much less time, and it's a, a more effective treatment. And the same goes with uh, the application of herbicide. It's one thing uh, to go into a huge infestation you know, that's, that's shoulder high and 100% you know, ground cover. Well, yeah, and then it may be appropriate to use a mist blower and, and um, um, you know, spray some herbicide around. But um, most of the time, I think people are a little wary of herbicides. They have to figure out the, you know, their, their idea of what's the risk of the herbicide versus the risk of the Lyme disease and all this kind of thing. And the two-step method allows you to do a very targeted treatment with a very small amount of chemical. Um, if, you're, uh, if you cut the the major plant away and you've used an iron rake to drag the, the cut piece away, when the new shoot comes up, you can, with a, with a little uh, uh, backpack uh, sprayer or something like that, you can do a very targeted application and not, uh, and not affect the surrounding, uh, uh, the surrounding vegetation as well. We used a variety of different methods for doing the mechanical treatment. The, uh, oops, sorry, um, the, uh, the brush saw, let's go back again, the brush saw, Mowers, these, uh, the DR mower st style of uh, uh, brush mower. Uh, we even uh, rented one of these large pecan mowers, and while that was uh, uh, fun, it was also very expensive. So uh, we wouldn't necessarily uh, recommend that. So um, what method you choose really depends on your energy level and your, uh, you know, your ability to um, uh, uh, round up the, the labor necessary. It's work, and it takes time. And, uh, um, Certainly, the herbicide treatments take a little less time and a little less expensive than the, the flame treatments or the multiple mechanical treatments. But there again, you have to compare your, your uh, willingness to invest time and, and resources uh, uh, versus uh, needing to get the job done quickly. So um, we find that the propane torch is useful uh, in small areas where it's wet, uh, where we have a volunteer labor pool available, um, in small patches. Uh, park settings, that sort of thing, where you don't want to uh, uh, be spraying um, uh, um, chemicals around. And really, you want to have damp conditions. Um, the, the flame really doesn't spread if the litter is damp. And uh, you might want to look into herbicide if, uh, um, if you have a lot clumps that are taller than four feet, if you have uh, full sunlight conditions, if you have these very extensive uh, uh, shoulder high infestations that go on and on and on. And you need to consider the, the cost and time and, and, and resources. Um, I'm going to ask Jeff, Jeff to weigh in on this. It's really uh, about uh, the, the, uh, the calculated risk. And uh, uh, there's a comparison chart here that uh, uh, shows the toxicity levels of various substances and uh, um, uh, sure. what the doses are that would be, uh, would be dangerous. And just real brief, I think all of us want to minimize uh, the herbicide use, and ideally we wouldn't have to use it. But there is the trade-off. Um, if whether we're going to use it to uh, control uh, larger areas and reduce the risk of Lyme disease, which for those of us who have had it, and I can't remember what you call it when all of a sudden I had like the worst flu in the world for three days when I took the antibiotics and gone through it, and some people have some permanent conditions from it, uh, versus you know a one-time shot of herbicide. And one of the questions always is, is well, herbicides are, are always poisonous. Well, it's really the dose is the poison. Uh, if you actually look at it, table salt is more poisonous than Roundup by weight, uh, which is pretty amazing. Um, so you always want to think the dose is the, the poison. So you want to make sure you always follow label directions. Um, and you have to see in your own mind, is it worth the balance? Of the you know the small increased risk of making sure small increased risk of being exposed to the, to the herbicide versus 
I think for most of us, there's very real risk of, of having a high chance of getting Lyme disease again. <clears throat> just, we'll take questions in a minute, just because we're almost done, but I want to make sure we get through everything. So I just want to have this one here. And here's just an example. Here's if you have 35% uh, barberry cover, which would be the equivalent, believe it or not, of where the chairs are, because there's actually spaces in between each chair and these rows. So that's approximately 35% barberry cover. And you have 40 hours labor. Here's how many acres you can treat with different methods. So here's why I said it's all a trade-off. Whoops. This is work. This one. Oh, come on. That's one of those things we all have to make judgments on our own properties and what we're going to do. And it's our, our risk assessment. Am I going to worry more about uh, you know this herbicide I'm using out here? Am I going to worry more about Lyme disease and trying to clear acres? And that's, as a property owner or as a citizen in your town or voter in your town or your town parks, that's something you have to decide. That's We're just going to show you what the options are. Differences. So just to let you know that alien invasives uh, can't be controlled, and if you control deer density and alien invasives in an area, you can reduce your risk of exposure to Lyme disease. So that, this business is kind of cute. So we're alien invasive problem, we have deer and just disturbances. Uh, actually, it's kind of complicated. But, uh, <laughs> for those of us of a certain age, that's a really cute movie. So, that's just it. And I apologize, Tom, I didn't have your contact in. But Tom's, I was going to say, I'm going to have to leave in a little bit. Uh, I have I'll, be here, I'll be here through lunch. He's going to be here through lunch. So how much, do we have time for one or two questions, Jasmine? I know we took yeah, a lot. Yeah, we'll just cut out the break. Huh? We'll cut out the break because this is important. Okay, because I don't want to get into the next speaker's time, so. No, we'll, we'll cut time out of I'm going to field break. questions, questions while I swap sure. out the presentation. So you had a question? Yeah. Well, I, I heard your point about um, the trade-off and yeah. um, you know Lyme disease versus um, you know you're getting it, but I still think that we're still looking at a very with a myopic view. I think you have to step up to the bigger view, and I know it's hard, but um, the chemicals have their other consequences that sometimes aren't seen from things that are done at this time, and I think our, our use of chemicals has really been shown, I think people are seeing all the time the consequences of chem the pesticide use. And I, I understand your point of view. Yeah. I'm just oh, saying. Oh, no, and I appreciate yours. And you know what? And, and here's what I look at the difference in, in, a, in a woods application or something like that. We're talking a one-shot deal maybe every 20 years on using a loaded model, as opposed to where, where I, I think, uh, this is my personal opinion, is that in agricultural systems where they really look at reliance on using chemicals year after year after year. For me, there's a difference between a one-shot target deal and doing mass amounts every year. So I still feel that that is um, a wrong because there's like a tipping point, and you're part of the tipping point. There's coming the, air, the chemicals we just had, I mean, the air quality in the air, Everything is part of the problem. So it just has to be looked at differently. You have to really regard it as No, and you're absolutely, and like I say, there's trade-offs. Even if you go out there, like I was showing before with the invasives, you know, it's, it's not just Lyme disease, which we, are, we all worry well, about. Well, I, I understand it's, your it's, point. Yeah, I well, well I, I guess what I'm saying is, is but if we go out there with the mechanical ones, um, there's actually going to be real environmental costs for that. Even if you're using, we'll say you're using a brush saw. Those things are some of the world's worst polluters. Uh, so you've got. Don't these chemicals that are applied once in 20 years? How many years do they remain? Uh, well, glyphosate has. That's a, random, basically, even, right? Yeah. Right. Well, it's, it's that's one of them. But even the European Union, which has the most, they say it has a half life of 120 days. So half it's gone in 120 days. After a year or two, it's basically gone. So, you know, there's some other ones which last longer. Uh, U.S. EPA says Roundup has a half-life of about 21 days. So I also want to think about where you're putting. I'm going to have to cut this off because we got another speaker sure. coming. But I do want to make thanks, Jeff. Sure. Uh, well, I do want to make sure that Tom had the chance to say any last words. If no, I just the, the only thing I would add to that conversation is that it's really our job to test all the alternatives, 
and provide you with the information so that you can make the intelligent decision that you need to make for your particular situation, and we're not necessarily advocating one thing or another. Thank you. So, and I, the question I had is, what are some of the other alien plants? I mean, you talked about barberry, and olive is another one. Should we kill that too? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. That's what I said. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Let's, okay. Let's thank these thank guys. You. Thank you. Thank you. conditions or infections that people come in with, they're a pretty easy fix. So if somebody gets like some other type of um, bacterial or viral infection, they come in, we give them medicine if that's what's needed, and then they're on their way, and a lot of times there's not long-term complications. But as everybody here knows, Lyme disease isn't that easy, and even after people are treated, there's symptoms that can last maybe indefinitely. So I just want to talk about some of the issues that contribute to that. When people are getting treated, they can also have certain symptoms arise. So I'll talk about complications from actual treatment itself. And then factors that contribute to, to illness and ways to overcome it. So the first issue is diagnosis. As we all know, Lyme disease symptoms present really differently in everybody, and they're really vague. So as somebody mentioned earlier, the symptoms can be so vague that you're not really sure if you're having an issue. So you might just be like, oh, I've been kind of tired, but I'm busy at work, or you know, things are kind of hectic. Or maybe you're having joint pain, but you went on a long hike. And so it's really easy to kind of just push through the symptoms at first, and you might not realize you're sick. And when that's the case, it really just gives the bacteria a longer time to um, to spread it in the body. Borrelia is one of the bacteria, or one of the infections that's been known as the great imitator. And so that just means that it, the symptoms that arise from it can really mimic a lot of different conditions. So that's another thing that makes it hard to actually get a proper diagnosis. And then also, as a lot of us know, the testing for it isn't the greatest at all. And so if, if someone came in and we're questioning if it's Lyme disease, it'd be really nice if we could just say, oh, let's do a blood test and see. But we know that that's not the case. So with it being such a complicated thing to diagnose, it makes it so the bacteria has a lot longer to spread and cause damage in the body. And so that's one reason why it's so hard to treat. The other thing is that it can really, with the longer time that we're taking to start treating it and to make an accurate diagnosis, it can cause a ton of damage in the body and it can really lead to um, widespread infections. So Borrelia, as said before, is a spirochete, meaning it's a spiral-shaped bacteria. And because of that corkscrew nature, it can really burrow deep into different body tissues um, all throughout the system which is scary, but it's one of the reasons why it can affect so many different regions of the body. Because it can burrow deep into different tissues, it's really hard to get medicines into those locations. So if we're giving antibiotics or things for more symptomatic control, sometimes it's hard to really deliver the medicine to that area and affect the Borrelia. And also when they evade different systems like that, they can escape the immune system in that way because they're hiding out and that makes it easy for them to just keep replicating. This is a picture of the different body systems. Um, it just goes through circulatory, nervous system, respiratory, digestive, and musculoskeletal. And then I also added on the endocrine system and the immune system. So every one of these can be affected by Lyme disease. That's why treatment really needs to be individualized too, because it's not the same in every single person. 
it really depends on what area of the body has been affected. I want to go through just a few of the ways that Borrelia can cause damage to some of the most common um, systems that are affected. First of all, though, I want to point out that our nervous system, we have two parts of it. We have our central nervous system, which is the brain and the spinal cord. And then we have the peripheral nervous system, which is all the other nerves in the body. And so first, I just want to talk about the central nervous system. So this picture here shows our blood vessels going through the body um, in location.